hello and welcome to the uh, to session four on um, the new treatments which we all want to hear about um, if you if you missed the morning session i'm barbara crossley and i'm a member of the uh, els patient advisory group and my co-chair is dr michael steinberg from israel if michael you'd like to in introduce yourself Yes, hi again. So for uh, those of you who are, have missed uh, the beginning, I'm a pulmonologist from Israel, a lung doctor from Haifa, Israel. Um, I take care of people with uh, bronchiectasis and also of people of, uh, with CF and uh, part of the MBAR collaboration. And uh, I agree with, with uh, Barbara that uh, it's uh, looking forward to the future that we're talking about now. And it's a very exciting and I'm sure uh, we all want to hear the uh, presentations. So um, Barbara, would you like to present the first uh, speaker? Yes, we, we have just two speakers. The first is the patient, um, Philip Alper. He's a member of the uh, European Lung Foundation patient advisory group, and he's from Israel, Philip. Uh, Philip has shared a video, but will be with us at the end of the session to answer questions. My name is Philip Alper, and I've been asked to speak about clinical trials. I'm a participant in a drug clinical trial, and this particular trial is for a drug that is hopefully going to reduce exacerbations in people with bronchiectasis. I'll tell you about my particular experience during the talk, but let me first just give you a little bit more information about drug clinical trials in general. I've shown on the screen the three main phases of a clinical trial. In the first preliminary phase, a small number of people are involved, mainly, I think, to test for safety. In the second intermediate phase, where I think more people are involved, the drug is further checked. Then, in a final phase three stage, where I am involved, a relatively large number of people of the order of 1,500 are involved. I'm a phase three participant checking the efficacy of a drug called Brensocatib. And I believe the whole of the testing being performed is funded by the makers of the drug. This slide shows the overall design of the phase three stage. And as you can see from the slide, there are hopefully a large number of participants. The phase three stage began in December 20, and I was enrolled in December 2021. For the trial, I am given a set of pills. <coughs> the trial is a double blind placebo-controlled trial, meaning that neither I nor the people administering the trial know which drug I am taking. In other words, in my pill box, there is either a placebo, 10 milligrams of the drug, or 25 milligrams of the drug. Before participating in the trial, I read an informed consent form, which describes in great detail, it's 16 pages long, what happens during the trial. This slide on the left shows the first page of the form. And as it says here, participation is voluntary and I can withdraw at any time with no negative impact on me if I do withdraw. The form also shows on the right what happens during the study. I go to the study center, in my case, Carmel Hospital in Haifa, Israel, eight times. I think I've been for about three so far. In those visits, they make various checks, for example, ECG tests, pulmonary tests, and they also take a blood sample. I'm checked physically by the study staff. In this case, nurse Maya Barak and a doctor, usually Dr. Steinberg. I'm also one of, by, called by one of these people administering the trial. In my case, Maya, who checks to see that I'm behaving well. In addition to the medical checks, I also keep a daily diary. For the trial, I take my pill, placebo, a 10 milligram or 25 milligram every day. In the morning, 
I tell the diary if I took the pill. In the evening, I complete a short questionnaire about my condition during the day. For example, was I short of breath? Was my sputum volume between a teaspoon and an egg cup? In conclusion, I'd like to thank Maya and Dr. Steinberg and the other people who test me and the pharmaceutical company for funding this. I know they're in, in it for a profit, but I feel that this part of their expenses is going to a good cause. I'd also like to encourage other people to volunteer as participants. If you check in the website for this drug, there are 360 centers in multiple countries. There are nine listed centers in Israel, and all of these are listed as recruiting. Maybe you can also be a volunteer. Thank you, Philip. That was that was really enlightening. I've never taken part in a trial myself. Uh, I've offered, but I haven't qualified. So yes, that was really good. Thank you very much. Now, Mikhail, would you like to introduce uh, Dr. Chalmers? Yes. So um, Professor James Chalmers um, is uh, uh, the British Lang Foundation Chair of Respiratory Research at the University of Dundee, UK. Um, and a consultant respiratory physician. He's also uh, one of uh, uh, the leaders of Embark, and I think his contribution to the uh, research and care of people with bronchiectasis over the past decade is enormous. And I think uh, uh, we all know that James is a wonderful speaker, and I'm really looking forward to his talk about new treatments for bronchiectasis. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Thank you so much to the organizers of the meeting. Um, it's a real privilege to be part of this community of clinicians and patients trying to find new treatments for bronchiectasis. Um, I've got one real objective for this final presentation, and it's to round off the day by giving you some hope that there's a lot of activity going on to generate new treatments for bronchiectasis. So if you leave with one message from me, it's that new treatments are coming um, and there is a bright future for people with bronchiectasis. And so hopefully what I'm going to tell you over the next 20 minutes will, will give you the evidence for that. Before we start, it's important that you know that I'm going to talk about new drugs. And I do a lot of uh, research and consultancies with pharmaceutical companies and charities that develop new treatments. I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done with them. Um, and so they're listed on the slide. I'm also going to talk about treatments that aren't currently approved. So please don't go and ask your doctor for these drugs because most of them I'm going to talk about are not available. I thought it would be useful to start off with answering the question, why don't we already have lots of really good drugs for bronchiectasis? And some of the speakers early in the day have addressed this, the fact that this has historically been a neglected area of research. This, the disease was first described in the 19th century, but very few doctors and very few scientists made this a priority because uh, as antibiotics were developed early in the 20th century, there was an assumption that bronchiectasis would just go away. So there was no need to do research into this condition because it wasn't going to be a problem in the future. It's been very difficult to diagnose until recently because the diagnostic techniques, there's an old bronchogram at the top right here, uh, were quite difficult to do. And so the advent of CT scanning has meant we can pick up a lot more patients with bronchiectasis who were previously diagnosed or misdiagnosed with other conditions. And that underlies what Amelia told you about earlier today, which is that there's been a big rise in the number of people diagnosed with bronchiectasis. Most of that, I suspect, is addressing underdiagnosis that's been going on for a long time. Some of the other barriers to getting the right treatment to the right patient have been the fact that this condition is often misdiagnosed as asthma or COPD. Uh, and so patients are given uh, other treatments before they finally get to a, a diagnosis of bronchiectasis. Sometimes it's dismissed as not being a real disease or it's, it's compared with CF bronchiectasis. 
uh, and trying to take treatments from CF and put them into bronchiexis has not been a successful strategy. All of this led bronchiexis to be described as one of the most neglected diseases in respiratory medicine. So again, one of my objectives today is to tell you that's not the case anymore. There's now a really vibrant community of doctors and scientists trying to find new treatments for bronchiectasis, and that's really come together over the last 10 to 15 years. So what can medical science achieve when it really sets its mind to something? Well, let's talk about COVID-19. If you think back two years, uh, this virus appeared out of nowhere and we had no treatments, no vaccine. We didn't understand how it caused disease and we didn't understand, uh, we didn't even have tests for it initially. And over the past two years, we've gone from that situation to having a situation where there's multiple treatments, multiple preventative strategies, multiple vaccines. COVID's still a problem, but medical science has made enormous advances in a very short period of time for another lung condition, which is what COVID-19 is. So can we learn anything from COVID-19 as a model of research success? Well, if we think about the drugs that, and the vaccines that have been developed for COVID, what have we got? So on, on the left-hand side of this slide, the first treatment that was shown to reduce uh, mortality or improve outcomes in COVID was a really old drug called dexamethasone. You've probably all heard of that one. So, and that's a drug that's been around for decades. It was applied to the right people at the right time in a big clinical trial. So in bronchiectasis, we could learn from that and think, are there lots of other drugs around that we know are already available, but could be better used in bronchiectasis? We call that repurposing or using drugs for a better purpose. And then as the pandemic has progressed, new drugs specific against COVID have been generated, like the antibodies. So could we generate new drugs using technologies that have, have recently been developed? Uh, and Dr. Altenberg actually spoke earlier about the idea of antibodies to treat pseudomonas. Why not? If we can develop antibodies in two years to target a virus, why couldn't we develop similar technologies to target a bacteria or other things that cause disease in bronchiectasis? And then the preventative tr strategies are really important. Vaccines have made the biggest impact on the, uh, the pandemic. Why don't we have vaccines against pathogens like Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Uh, and why don't we talk more about preventing chest infections and preventing bronchiectasis uh, rather than treating the consequences? So another lesson I would say we've learned from the pandemic is that prevention is better than cure. So I'm going to talk about all of these three things, really. Can we make better use of existing treatments? How are we going to make new drugs? Uh, and how are we going to prevent severe disease? So where we are at the moment, and this has been dealt with all through the day, so I'm not going to spend very much time on this, is we have antibiotic treatments that can target infection. We have some anti-inflammatory medications that include the macrolides and steroids. We have airway clearance and some other medications that can help muca uh, mucociliary clearance, getting the, getting the phlegm up. And we don't have much that can regenerate the lung, but occasionally surgery is used when there's an area of lung that's particularly damaged. What can we add into this or what can we uh, or how can we target treatments better to the right patient? Well, let's start by thinking about the targeting of treatment to the right patient and the differences between different patients. I've got a little question here. Um, do antibiotics work for you when you get a chest infection? So the question is, if you have a chest infection and you get an antibiotic, which of the following best describes you? I usually feel better very quickly. I usually feel better very quickly, but sometimes need several courses. Antibiotics don't often work quickly and I need more courses or have to take a longer time to recover. I don't get antibiotics or you don't know. So launch the poll, please. The reason for asking the question is the vast majority of patients, so about 70% of bronchiectasis patients, receive antibiotics every year according to our registry data. So it's the main treatment that we use for bronchiectasis. And the question is how, uh, how consistent is the response to antibiotics? Have we got a result? 
forgive me, I don't know. There we go. That's almost exactly what I thought the results were going to be, a kind of uh, split between the different options. So about a third of people say they, they have a really great response to antibiotics. About a third of people who uh, need several courses, but, but will get better. And some who really feel that antibiotics don't make a great deal of difference. Why is that? So what, what is driving that difference in response to different treatments, which is what I hear in my clinic every single day? I think it's because patients with bronchiectasis are very different between each other. And I'll show examples of that in a moment. Probably the most effective treatment that we have in bronchiectasis at the moment is the macrolides. And um, Dr. Altenberg, who spoke earlier today, uh, was one of the first to show that these are effective. Um, they're most the most commonly used type of macrolide is azithromycin, and the data shows that it cuts chest infections by about 50%, um, which is fantastic. It's better than almost anything else that we have. And about two thirds of patients also feel better with less mucus and things if they take this, this medication. But not everybody gets better. Um, indeed, a proportion of patients get no response to the macrolides at all. And in this study that we published um, a couple of years ago now, we showed that it's people who had more inflammation in the system and bugs like Pseudomonas that responded best, um, but that many patients who didn't have those things didn't uh, experience a benefit. And so antibiotics don't work for everyone, meaning we need to develop treatments that are not antibiotics. And emphasizing this point that everybody's different, and there isn't going to be just one drug that cures the problem for bronchiectasis, when we asked patients what are the main problems that they have, what symptoms that they have, the most common symptom is sputum, um, and about 70 to 80% of patients have problems with sputum, but some don't. Many patients have problems with exacerbations, but some patients never have exacerbations. Some patients have problems with cough or shortness of breath, but many patients never have those symptoms. So you're not going to find a single treatment that cures the problem for people who have this very diverse range of different symptoms. We need to tailor the treatments that we give to the problems that patients have. And you've heard also today about the importance of other aspects of this disease, like diet, exercise, airway clearance, mental health, all of which impact on quality of life for our patients. And so we need multiple approaches to treatment if we're going to uh, make a difference. And another way of describing that is to talk about this idea of personalized medicine. That's treating people as people rather than treating people as disease labels. If every patient with bronchiectasis is different, as illustrated here by people with a different uh, color, we can use tests and we can use questions and we can use uh, our observations as clinicians to put patients into groups to say, this group is more likely to respond to an antibiotic this group is less likely to respond to an antibiotic. But ultimately, medical science can help us to find tests, biological tests that can uh, tease out responses to treatment even more effectively than just asking questions. Uh, and that's called endotyping, or uh, another way of putting it is sort of finding a fingerprint that will identify you as somebody that will respond to a particular type of treatment. And this is, I believe, the only way we're going to get to effective new treatments for bronchiectasis because everyone with this disease is so different. Now, to give you an example of this, um, and this is research that's hot off the press just the last few weeks, we know that there's a certain type of inflammation in the lungs that responds really well to inhalers that contain steroids. 60% of people who have bronchiectasis in Europe take inhalers that contain steroids, but we don't know uh, because we don't have trials whether they work or not and who they work in. So um, we did research across the whole of Europe um, looking at the prevalence, the presence of this type of inflammation in people with bronchiectasis in sputum tests and in blood tests. And it was remarkably consistent, you can see from the map, that about 20% of people had this type of inflammation that is thought to respond to the type of inhalers that many people are taking. Now that's really interesting. And at the same time, uh, another of the speakers earlier today, Dr. Alberti, was looking at patients who'd taken a steroid in a study uh, and showed that whereas across the whole population of people who took it in that study, 
only a small number got better, had less symptoms with the inhaler. When they looked at people that had this high blood test showing that they had that type of inflammation, nearly half felt better when they took the inhaler. So this is an example of what I was talking about at the beginning of a drug we are, it's already around. We know these inhalers are being used, but we can find the right people to use them in and potentially therefore um, improve outcomes for patients without having to develop a completely new drug. This is the concept of personalized medicine that I think really needs to be applied to bronchiectasis. Now you heard the lovely presentation earlier today uh, about uh, the experiences of being in a clinical trial. That clinical trial that was described is of a new drug trying to reduce inflammation in bronchiectasis. Inflammation is really easy to recognize in bronchiectasis because that uh, green sputum that we cough up every day, that contains inflammatory cells called neutrophils. And the reason it's thick uh, and green is because these cells that I've illustrated on the right are green, they contain a green protein. And you can see this is a zoomed in electron micrograph of uh, a, a neutrophil trying to trap bacteria with this thick, sticky DNA. Uh, so it traps the bacteria to stop them spreading. But that also makes the sputum very thick and can contribute to exacerbations. Um, so recently, drugs have been developed that can stop this process from happening. They stop the release of these damaging uh, proteins that contribute to the sputum and contribute to the inflammation that patients in bronchexis have. Uh, and that's the trial uh, that the previous speaker is participating in in a phase three trial. We performed a, a phase two study in 256 patients of this new drug that's called Brenzocatib. Uh, two doses of that medication, 10 milligrams and 25 milligrams and it markedly reduced the amount of inflammation in the lungs. So this is a graph of the inflammation in the lungs. Uh, the lower it goes, the less inflammation there is. And at the 25 milligram, it almost completely got rid of the inflammation in some patients. And in the patients where it did get rid of the inflammation, there was a clear reduction in the number of chest infections that people had. And that's on the next slide. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it's counting the number of people who are having chest infections. And you can see here about 50% of people had chest infections in the group that didn't get the drug. And that was reduced to only about a third in people that did get the medication. So that's really exciting because this is not an antibiotic, it's an anti-inflammatory medication. And it seems to be able to reduce or switch off the inflammation in the lungs that causes a lot of the problems. So it, you can see where this is sort of going is that we have a type of inflammation that can be treated with the steroids that represents a small proportion of the bronchiectasis patients. And we have a type of inflammation here that can be treated with an anti-neutrophil medication. And so in addition to the effective antibiotics that we have, there's also the potential to reduce inflammation. I have one last question here, which is around the COVID-19 pandemic. Has the COVID-19 pandemic had an effect on your bronchiectasis? So this is really targeting towards the patients that are here today. Option one is, have you had more chest infections? Often option two, less chest infections. Option three, about the same. D, I don't know. Um, and this is comparing before the pandemic to the 2020-21 sort of period. Can we launch the poll? Fantastic. I'm really curious what the result's going to be here. Because we've kind of been through a natural experiment over the last two years. Everybody has changed their lifestyle completely as a result of the effects of the pandemic. Um, and it's allowed us to learn a little bit about what does cause bronchiectasis exacerbations and other ways in which we might be able to prevent them. Um, and some of the speakers earlier today mentioned a little bit around things like viruses. Are we able to see the results? And there, that's, so that's absolutely fascinating. So about half of people reported having less chest infections, some the same, and a smaller proportion having more. And that's what I would expect. I wouldn't expect everybody to have exactly the same experience of the pandemic, but over, overall, most people having fewer chest infections. And this slide was shown earlier today by Amelia, 
um, which shows a study conducted in the UK where 48%, there was a 48% reduction in chest infections during the pandemic, which is almost as much of a reduction as we saw with the drugs. So it suggests that in fact, changes to how we behave in our lifestyle might be just as effective as drugs in reducing chest infections. Why might that be? And this is now tying together the talk from Lucy Morgan earlier today and also uh, from Peter, about half of exacerbations, we think, this is data from an Embark study, are caused by viruses like the common cold virus or respiratory syncytial virus. So less exposure to viruses may mean fewer exacerbations. And there was also reduction in pollution during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and work from, from Peter who spoke earlier today had shown uh, around a 50% increase in exacerbations on days when there's a significant spike in air pollution in the atmosphere. So a combination of both changes in our behavior, changes in the environment and changes in viral transmission may have contributed to less exacerbations during the pandemic, which leaves us with an interesting question about what we do now going forward. Um, and I'm certainly advising my patients to be a bit more careful around people with symptoms coming to their house um, and around going out in days when pollution is very bad as a result of, of these lessons that we've learned from the pandemic. So in the last two minutes, two really important concepts to think about. One is that um, historically, patients with bronchitis have told me one of the most frustrating things is that they, uh, uh, they wait until the exacerbations happen and then they get antibiotics to rescue the symptoms, but they would rather be doing something to improve the disease before they get an exacerbation. And a good analogy here is what we used to do for asthma, which was to give people a blue inhaler that masked the symptoms, and you only got a preventer once you had lots of exacerbations. And that's now not acceptable practice in asthma. Now everybody gets a preventer according to international guidelines. And I'm starting to uh, really advocate this also in bronchiectasis. Our mindset should be uh, that our job is to prevent people from getting chest infections or getting worse rather than waiting for exacerbations to happen and masking the symptoms with antibiotics. And finally, let's think about the future. So you've heard about uh, new anti-inflammatory drugs, new repurposing of drugs that we've had for a long time, but using them in the right patients. Where are we going to get the next generation of drugs from that are going to change the, change the game in bronchiectasis? One of them, I think, is in identifying what the cause of bronchiectasis for the majority of people is. Uh, there's a huge amount of work now going on into genetics of bronchiectasis, finding out uh, in people who thought they didn't have a reason for having bronchiectasis, that in fact they had a gene that caused this problem. Uh, and the world of primary serious kinesia, which is a uh, genetic form of bronchiectasis, has seen the discovery of more than 50 genes now that cause this. Why does that matter? Well, it's because cystic fibrosis shows us that if you identify what causes something, you can develop drugs that can directly target and reverse that defect. So in cystic fibrosis, uh, from the, discover the first description of the disease, through to the present day, there have been dozens of medications that have been developed. It wasn't one drug that changed the game in CF, it's multiple, the development of multiple medications, including antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, and things that help to clear mucus. But the discovery of the gene uh, meant that the uh, drug companies and academics were able to develop drugs that directly target the gene defect and produce changes like that shown at the bottom right here, which is a massive improvement in quality of life after the uh, administration of these drugs that directly target the defect. In the future, it's very likely we will be able to do similar things for specific types of bronchiectasis that are caused by genes. Um, and leaving that to one side, there are also now trials beginning of using these modulators of CFTR in bronchiectasis because many people who have bronchiectasis also have dysfunction of this channel that's associated with cystic fibrosis. And so we can both learn the lessons from CF in terms of how we develop things, but also take drugs that have been shown to be effective there uh, and potentially put them into our 
uh, patients as well. So I hope I've I hope I've shown you with a few examples that there's a huge amount of activity going on in research in bronchiectasis. We've gone from a neglected disease now to one where there are dozens of trials going on at any one time. There are drugs that are now in phase three, meaning they're very close to being delivered to patients. And through a combination of laboratory research and collecting data from patients on the left-hand side of this slide, and then testing the right drugs in the right patients in clinical trials on the right, we're moving towards a situation where I genuinely believe in the next two or three years, there will be new licensed treatments for bronchiectasis. And then after that, there's a very healthy pipeline of new therapies that are uh, hopefully going to make their way to patients in the coming years. A lot of this work is as a result of the brilliant advocacy of patients, the European Lung Foundation patient group, pushing clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, governments to fund and to conduct bronchiexis research. Uh, and I'm really proud that, uh, that everyone who's been involved in this meeting, but everyone in our bronchiexis community has played a part in, in changing the situation that we're in with respect to bronchiectasis. So with that, a, a massive thank you to all of the people who've participated in some of the studies that I uh, mentioned uh, and everyone who's participated in the conference today. Uh, you really are an amazing group of people and it's a privilege to be, to be part of this. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for two uh, brilliant uh, talks that we uh, heard today. And um, uh, maybe uh, I can start in st some of the uh, questions and uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Philip. Philip, are you um, with us? So there was one uh, yes, question in Hold this. On. Thanks. So there was one question in the chat how can you keep up with the uh, clinical trials uh, that are available for patients? So if someone wants to uh, be enrolled in a clinical trial, what would you recommend? Well, what I, you came to me and asked me to be, <laughs> and, and when but I if checked, I didn't. <laughs> and, and when I checked in the, um, in the clinical, trials.gov site, it showed that there are 360, I think it's now up to 400, different places looking for volunteers for, for, for the particular drug that I'm taking. There are nine in Israel. I'm sure there are hundreds in you know, more than many, many in the United Kingdom, in all the countries and the people that are listening to this now. And so what they have to do is go to their doctor or go to their clinic and tell them they want to be a volunteer. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. I have a question for James. I'm particularly interested in, in, in personalized treatment. Um, and uh, I wondered, how do you get classified into phenotypes and endotypes? Um, to enable this precision medicine that you're talking about. Is it done at the moment only in research centres or could it be done in, in my normal respiratory clinic now? No, so it's something that we want to train all doctors to do clinically. I mean, a lot of doctors are doing it without knowing that that's what it's called, but it's really about asking the right questions in clinic um, and also addressing all of the different aspects of the disease. So some of, some of my patients will say, when I ask them about, for example, nasal symptoms, and they've got terrible symptoms, oh, that's the first time anyone's ever asked me about that. And when you treat that, the rest of their disease gets better. Uh, but it's only if you know to ask that and to treat the patient as an individual, some patient, patients have nasal symptoms, some don't, um, that you start to improve outcomes. And so it's about accepting that our patients have lots of different problems and we need to spend the time and do the tests to go through all of those problems and address them in a consistent and uh, appropriate way. And that's how you get the best outcomes. If we say, well, the most common problem is infection, so we're gonna treat everybody with antibiotics and forget the rest, you won't get 
the same quality of outcomes. And so that's really what the message about personalized medicine is. So I guess the advice to patients would be, don't be afraid to go to your doctor with a list of several things, uh, because that will help them to identify the different treatable traits, which is what I call them, that they need to be addressing. Thank you. So there are uh, some questions in the in the chat box. Um, um, uh, there was a person asking about uh, t um, studies on uh, aspergillosis, on aspergillus, uh, and and James, do you know of any uh, trials to address that? Uh, I'm not aware of any trials at the moment for aspergillosis, but it is very important that we do them. Um, so that's a disease where um, the current treat, if we're talking about allergic aspergillosis, the current treatment is steroids. But there are some exciting new drugs that have the potential to have benefits in that patient population. Uh, and so it's really important that we also do trials in, in, in groups like that. There was another. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Barbara. <laughs> There's another question in the chat about um, antibiotics and anti-inflammatories during pregnancy has any been has any research been done on the impact of those drugs on on pregnant women and fetus yeah so the, it depends on which antibiotics you're talking about so there's a lot of antibiotics that are very safe in pregnancy so the penicillins for example are safe in pregnancy if you're thinking about becoming pregnant though and you're a bronchiectasis patient and you're taking long-term antibiotics it's good to have a discussion with your doctor because depending on which antibiotics you're taking sometimes it's possible to switch over to a safer alternative in general however um, the advice is that the the best way to ensure a safe pregnancy for a bronchiectasis patient is to make sure their bronchiectasis is well controlled so in for the vast majority of cases uh, the drugs are are safe to continue because it's better to keep people's lungs um, healthy and well controlled during pregnancy. So don't don't stop something because you're thinking about becoming pregnant. Discuss it with your discuss it with your doctor. Yes, I can re also relate to that in in uh, women with cystic fibrosis who nowadays be uh, more largely become pregnant. So most of the treatments are uh, better continued than stopped because um, um, it's the, the danger is that you exacerbate if you don't take your regular treatments, while the uh, potential risk for the pregnancy is very, very potential. And uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, mainly the concern is that we don't have enough information rather, rather than we do know that something is harming. Um, other uh, questions in the chat were about um, uh, how long are we taking uh, drugs in bronchiectasis? And this is sometimes that uh, a question that I, I sometimes ask myself. So how long do we um, continue treatments um, in bronchiectasis? This was a specific um, about a certain drug, but I think it's, it's true for any other drugs. So chronic medication, inhaled antibiotics, azithromycin, um, other drugs that are um, in, cl in clinical trials. How long do we know that we need to, to continue? So maybe I'll kick off with that one. Most, most trials are done over a year because it's difficult to do trials over much longer periods of time. But we know that people take drugs for much longer than a year. Uh, so it's important then that we collect information about the benefits of medications beyond the, the time that they're tested in trials. I will often have a conversation with my patients after they've been on treatments for a year or two years about whether we continue them or not, because we don't know for a lot of medications um, how long they remain beneficial for. Um, and uh, so for some people, it will be appropriate to stay on a long term antibiotic for a long time. For some people, they'll be really keen to take a holiday from a a medication and see if they manage without it for a period because maybe they were going through a very difficult period when they started the antibiotic and things are getting better so i wouldn't make any hard and fast rules about durations of treatment but we should always be thinking or i'm always thinking as a clinician uh, if there's a list of medications are there any of those that we could stop for a period because you should only be taking medication if you really need to 
There's another question for you, James, from the chat. Can you see monoclonal antibodies being used for bronchiectasis? So absolutely. I mean, I, the, the COVID analogy that I gave, I think, is a really important one. The, the, um, the therapeutic development in COVID has been amazing. If you can develop an antibody against COVID in two years, we must be able to develop antibodies against some of the bugs that cause problems in bronchiectasis. Um, and I'm sure that that will, that will come in the next few years. Um, I also think the vaccine story is really important. So the development of the mRNA technologies for much better vaccines and immune responses should mean that we should be able to prevent some of these infections before they happen like other respiratory viruses that cause exacerbations. So I think this, this is a, a really exciting time in medical science. It's been a really difficult time in society, but there is the, the potential to build on these technologies to really benefit people with lung conditions. Um, and so I think we should be excited about what could be coming in the future um, for, for fighting infections with these technologies. So I, I think we have time for uh, one, a few, uh, one or two questions before we uh, uh, close. Uh, so how do you think uh, we uh, conduct studies about physiotherapy? There's a, a, a question resembling that in the, in the chat. How easy is it to do studies on physiotherapy, on chest clearance? Impossible. <laughs> no, it's very, very difficult. And I wish Arietta was still here as an academic physio who's trying to do this because I think it is incredibly difficult. I mean, let me let me ask Barbara and Philip. In most studies, you would have a group that got the medication or the treatment and a group that didn't. And physio is so valuable to patients. It's almost impossible for me to imagine doing a study where I didn't give some sort of physio to one half of the group. And I wonder if patients would even accept that because it seems so unfair. So that, that I think is the main difficulty why we haven't got big studies on physio. Can, can I, I just, my physiotherapist, when I told her that I felt that my placebo or whatever it says is actually improving my, my state, she said, maybe it's your physiotherapy. And so the whole point is, you know, we don't, exactly what you say, need a placebo or somebody not doing physiotherapy as well. So we don't know that. I, I know for a fact that I couldn't do without physiotherapy, even for a day, I would feel ill. Um, but when I'm at home, I do measure the amount of mucus that, that uh, I, I bring up um, by weighing it on kitchen scales. I collect it. it collect the tissues in a plastic bag and weigh the plastic bags at the end of the day. And in that way, I can tell the ups and downs of my uh, mucus production and clearance. So that's a kind of measure that I use personally, but I don't know if you could use it in a clinical or research setting at all. So that, so that's yes, so. both, both really great comments. So that's, that's my view is we, sh we should do research to find what's the best type of physio because everyone's doing different types. Um, but ultimately, we're just going to have to accept that we don't have big randomized studies of physio. It's a good thing. I don't need a randomized controlled trial to say that jumping out of a plane without a parachute is a bad idea. <laughs> and I don't need a randomized controlled trial to tell me that doing physio is a good idea. Yeah, I, my, my personal view is, is this is one of the treatments that really need to be uh, very personalized because uh, I think people can find out for themselves what works. And this is why right. it's extremely difficult to do studies because there's no uh, better uh, methods than, than other. But this is my feeling. So, um, I think we are uh, getting uh, close to, to uh, the end of this uh, amazing day. And I would like to invite uh, Anno uh, to, uh, yes. so, for some closing remarks. And thank you, uh, Philip and James. 
Right. Thank you, Michal. So as we've now come to the end of uh, session four, um, we really do hope that it's been, uh, you found this informative and useful. Um, I mean, based on the, the different Q&A questions that we've had, I think it's been absolutely great participation. And thank you so much for all of that, because the more questions we ask, the, the better things can get. Um, just reflecting some on the things that inspire me, apart from the discussions that we had um, in the different sessions and the questions. Um, I think what, what I have been hearing more and more is that uh, there is, while, while so in comparison to uh, the situation that we had with COVID uh, and the, the speed at when we had this vaccination against it, it, it just goes to show that if a disease affects everybody in the world, there will be a lot more speedy resolve to the situation. But unfortunately, we do have a somewhat of a rare disease. Um, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic that there is a lot more research being done about it. And this, at least personally for me, it gives a lot of hope. Um, so this is great. Um, but as a take home message, and given that we do have a number of the healthcare professionals also attending here, um, I would just like to advocate with you. Uh, for us, you are sort of the ambassadors in raising awareness amongst your peers about bronchiectasis, and we, we truly appreciate that you're here with us. There's still many patients who are struggling with having a timely diagnosis, um, and as it was mentioned during the last session, prevention is better than cure. And uh, they also struggle receiving the correct care that they need because of the rarity of the disease. It's just not really that known. So please do share your knowledge widely and raise the awareness with your colleagues, especially those who might not even have anything to do with pulmonology or respiratory diseases, and especially amongst the primary healthcare professionals, because they are sort of at the first entry point for a lot of the patients. And from my own personal experience, it, it has made a difference when somebody has shared this information with other healthcare providers. Uh, so it does make a difference. Um, and in the current slide, you can actually see um, how, if you're interested in keeping in touch and receiving more information, uh, you can, for example, sign up for the EFL newsletter or follow them on social media. And you can also find more information on Embark's website and their Twitter account. And there is also the bronchiectasis patient website shown here. That's uh, in three different languages, uh, in English, Dutch, and French. So over to you, Michal. So thank you, Anno. Um, so some final thank yous to all of the speakers for wonderful talks, for the patient who contributed and uh, shared their uh, videos or spoke in person, for all the session chairs, the members of the Embark Steering Committee, and our wonderful bronchiectasis patient advisory group and everyone else who helped uh, promote and uh, manage the event today and everyone who joined us on the day. Your remarks are very, very important. It's amazing how much we uh, learn from um, all of you, from our patients, from family uh, members. Um, I'm reminding you that uh, the talks have been recorded and we aim to get them on the ELF website in a few days. Um, ELF will notify all of the um, uh, registrants by, by email and you'll be able to uh, watch again or the parts that you've missed or uh, forward to uh, your, uh, your friends. So um, with that, I wish you a, a good rest of the day and we'll really hope to see you again next year. Bye everyone. <laughs>